Okay, we just read those three passages. Uh, what I want to discuss is the common theme to uh, the passage that uh, Robbie read in Romans 13, 1 through 8, and then, Mikey, what you wrote in Matthew 20, 20 to 28, and what I'm going to read when I, we go into Ephesians 4. And all of them have the theme of talking about the true nature of authority. And the true nature of authority is service or functionality. Now I'd like to first just talk about what, uh, Matthew 20 where in Jesus, um, John, James and John's mother wanted Jesus to make her sons the top dogs. She wanted them, when, when Christ's kingdom was set up, she wanted them to be in high positions. Which is natural for any mother. A mother wants the best for her kids. There was nothing particularly sinister. It was self it was selfish, but not particularly evil. And so then Jesus said, "Are you prepared to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with?" In other words, are they willing to do what Jesus did? And there's a reason that Jesus asked them, "Are you willing to do what He did?" Because service is the basis of true authority. And but his, James and John and his mother had the wrong ideas, and really the, the, the ten that were angry had the wrong idea about what authority was about. Because when man rebelled, the idea of what authority was 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 corrupted. The world defines authority as a position. You know, you you go into a workplace, somebody was put into a position, they was installed, or somebody may have this certificate that says that they can do this. And so they have this position, they have this paper that says, I'm in charge. And people think that that's what authority is. It's uh, sometimes called traditional authority or rational legal authority. And other times it's called positional authority. It's, it exists because you're installed in this position and somebody's arbitrarily decided that John Smith over here is in charge. And it, it, the piece of paper can be anything from a, a license to teach. It could be papers that says that you're chairman of the board. Uh, it could be a deed to your house. That's a paper that says that I'm in charge. But Jesus said, this enough shall not be so among you. But he who will be the greatest, he who wants to be the greatest, if you want to have authority, you have to be the servant of all. Now when we think about service, another word for service is functionality. And in Romans 13, it talks about submitting to the governing authorities. And this passage has been misinterpreted because people have had that faulty concept of authority. What does it say in there? It defines what government is, not just anything that makes a claim. But government is defined there as the servant of God for your good, to execute vengeance on the wrongdoers. And that passage ends in verse 8. It says, ultimately, not to let any debt we remain outstanding. And the King James it says, owe no man anything, but the obligation to love one another. God said of government, but because he loved us, he wanted to protect our rights. He wanted to give us rights, and then he wanted to provide a way to protect it. So he established governing authorities. And so government was based upon the willingness and capability of people to do just that. To punish the wrongdoers, to pull rapists, murderers, thieves off the streets so that people can feel safe and secure in their persons and their property. That's why government came into existence. So in God's economy, government was defined by service. Those who are in authority, the police, the mayors, the judges, even the president, their role is to provide a service. That way I don't have to have ammo belt and an M16 strapped on me at all times. Because if we had no government, that's how we would have to live. I would have to be armed to the teeth, always ready to fight. But because there is a governing authority, because we do have the police, I don't have to do that. I don't have to have an M16 in my hand while, I, while I'm leading the Bible study. That was God's idea. But again, because man fell, ideas have been corrupted. If you look at what actually happens in the governments of the world, 
And this follows not only to the civil government, when we think of the government of the city of Jeffersonville, the state of Indiana, or, or the United States of America, but this happens in how businesses are governed, how schools are governed, how churches are governed. And the government of the church is of particular interest to the Lord. Because Jesus was telling these future apostles, this is, uh, I'm going to give you authority over the church. This is how you're going to run it. You're not going to, you're not going to run it. You're not going to lord it over people. You're not, you're, you're not going to let everyone know all the time, I'm the guy in charge. You're going to do it my way. You're, you're not to say my way or the highway. Their authority was based on their service. And in the church, and when we read in Ephesians, and in just a few minutes here, uh, I'm going to go into Ephesians, the fourth chapter here. Uh, starting in the 11th verse, where it talks about the government of the church. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. This, some refer to this as a five-fold ministry, even though there's really four offices. Pastor and teacher are the same office, but people commonly call it the five-fold ministry. Uh, they were given, in verse 12, For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. In other words, leaders are sent to equip the church to bring us to this place of maturity. That we, sh in verse 14, should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In other words, when leaders are doing their job, then everyone is equipped and then everyone has their part to play. And they do it according to their gifting. Each of us has been given us a unique set of spiritual gifts. And as each one of us uses that gift, the body of Christ is edified. In other words, everyone in the church has some measure of authority that is directly correlated to giftings, to our ability to provide a service to the body of Christ. And, and with the high positions of authority, when we think of elders, an elder, when you look at the qualifications, uh, there are several lists. There's one in Timothy and another one in Titus on the elders. They're, those qualifications on their ability to serve, their, particularly their ability to teach and their ability to govern and, and administrate the church. Uh, when we look here at the offices of teacher, obviously uh, the authority of a teacher in God's economy is rooted in one's ability to teach. If you don't know, you can't teach. If you can't communicate what you know, you can't teach. So to have authority as a teacher is rooted in being able to teach. Pastoring, you, you have to have the heart of a pastor to shepherd people, to uh, lead people by the hand when necessary and know when to release them into ministry. If you can't do that, you, you can't be a pastor. And with evangelists, the similar thing, the ability to communicate the gospel, to share the gospel with those who have never heard it, or with those who are discipled to introduce them to something new. And that's what the evangelists did. The evangelists did a lot of discipleship back in the New Testament. But a lot of them would be delivery agents when the apostles would write the letters the evangelists would deliver the letters to the various churches. Sometimes they would do redundant. They would deliver the letters, then the apostle would come, and that way they were able to confirm what the apostles actually wrote. And that was the job of the evangelist. The job of the prophet was based on his ability to hear God. And the apostle, when you read it at the end of Acts 1, and you can also look in Numbers 12. In Numbers 12, God talks about how when he speaks to a prophet, he'll get a dream in the night. He'll get a vision in the night. But that it wasn't so with Moses. Moses, He talked to Moses face to face. 
And when you read in Acts, at the end of Acts chapter 1, and then Paul talks about it at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, the mark of an apostle, what made an apostle an apostle, is seeing Jesus Christ face to face. They saw, the apostles saw him face to face. They had this eyewitness testimony. And we also have a witness testimony. And our authority in the church is connected directly to our witness. And so this is what the Lord wants us to do in the church. And part of what frustrates the Lord in so much of the church world is that so much of the church has lost track of this. The church all too often governs just like the world. We do all the world's things, including, unfortunately, a lot of times, a lot of the dirty tricks that people do in the world. That's why Jesus talked about the uh, princes of the Gentiles lording it over them. Uh, basically, they were doing, any, and another one says, exercise authority upon them. In other words, in the world, people will do anything and everything to keep you under their thumb. And that's, that's, that's how the world works. Jesus was endorsing that way of working, but that, that's how the world works. And Jesus, the Lord Jesus clearly says, this shall not be so among you. He who wants to be great should be the servant of all. So when we pray and, and seek God for what he wants us to do, how he wants to take us to the next level, let that always be the government, the way that Zion's hill is governed. And, and let us be willing and able to share that with others, hoping uh, that churches that are not right would be turned around. And like I preached a couple weeks ago, all too often the old wineskins will be tossed out. And that's God's judgment for what churches he's going to turn around, what churches are already raised, and what ones he's going to bypass. But we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And having a government that's based on service and on giftings by God takes us a step closer to truly setting our eyes on Jesus, truly being focused on Christ, and acknowledging Him as the King of kings, as the Lord of lords, as well as our personal Lord and Savior.